Uh, hi, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Brendan McGinty. I'm part of the leadership team of the Center for AI Innovation. Our seminar series continues again today on the topic of a shared memory approach to big data and analytics. Our speaker, uh, Peter Hosty, PhD, is an IBM Distinguished Research Staff member in the Power Systems Performance Organization in Austin, Texas, and a professor at Delft Technical University in the Netherlands. He's best known for his contributions to heterogeneous computing as the architect of the synergistic processor elements in the cell broadband engine processor used in the Sony PlayStation 3 and the Roadrunner supercomputer, which was the first to break the petaflop Linpack barrier. He's combined his work in heterogeneous computing by working on shared memory compute at the node level by developing an FPGA-based prototype of shared memory interface for external processing elements on Power 7, later productized on Power 8. He worked on the IBM research in, on, with IBM Research in Ireland to develop an FPGA-based prototype on Power 9 for memory sharing between nodes, which also helped lead to a new memory inception capability on the Power 10 processor. He draws much of his inspiration from large problems in big data and analytics. He holds a doctorate in theoretical physics from Groningen University and a PhD in computer science from Caltech. He holds well over 100 US patents and has published widely. Okay, so um, what, what I'd like to do today is uh, talk about uh, a, a journey uh, that, that I've personally been through and I think, um, you know, has, has had some, some industry impact as well uh, about, um, you know, how, how to organize computer systems to uh, most effectively share memory uh, for big data and, uh, and analytics. So uh, for, for large systems, you know the cost of the uh, the, the memory and uh, the network you know can make up as much as two thirds of the cost of the system um, so uh, i think a uh, what is sometimes called a, a memory centric approach uh, makes sense um, and i think there are maybe five different uh, aspects here that are coming together to uh, create what what i i think i hope you'll agree is a, is a fairly uh, interesting set of circumstances that uh, allows us to maybe kind of rethink how uh, computer systems are organized. So what we'll do is uh, we'll look a little bit uh, at heterogeneous shared memory processors. That's a bit of a uh, retrospective. Uh, briefly touch on higher latency uh, and less expensive per bit memory technologies. Um, and then uh, we'll look at uh, something that IBM is introducing with uh, Power 10 and that we've prototyped on Power 9 uh, called memory, uh, well, on Power 10 it's called memory inception. The prototype called, is called uh, Thymesis Flow. And uh, the theme here is memory disaggregation. And then I want to talk just a little bit about uh, software aspects, uh, standardized in memory formats. Uh, and um, increased memory latency tolerance, which I, I'll actually talk about a little bit in the beginning as well. And then we'll net it out. And uh, as promised in the summary, uh, I'll provide uh, uh, some of the uh, questions. You know, there's a bunch of things that, um, that I really don't know yet uh, myself. So first, um, you know, uh, how, how do we share memory uh, most effectively on conventional processors? Well, that's with an SMP organization. And here you see kind of a physical representation of a uh, multi-core or multi-chip uh, power uh, uh, architecture processor. And this is similar for, uh, for other architectures as well. Right, so you see the ISA compliant core uh, attached to a coherent bus uh, through a memory management unit and uh, bus interface. Um, you know, that memory management unit takes care of, uh, of address translation, provides all of the cores with a consistent view of memories, allows them to share pointers, etc. cetera. And uh, uh, as an aside on power, we have uh, two level address translation. So we have uh, uh, go from effective addresses to virtual addresses to real addresses. And, uh, you know, because most of you, I think are probably 
uh, more familiar with systems that use a, a single level translation. I'll, I'll uh, you know, I'll use virtual addresses to stand for, uh, you know, what would be effective addresses on power systems. So in the cell broadband engine, if you'll indulge me, because this is where uh, this kind of journey began for me, uh, what we did is we added, uh, we, we expanded, um, you know, what uh, can use this uh, shared memory coherent architecture uh, by having the uh, synergistic processing elements, which were the uh, heterogeneous element in the cell processor, uh, actually also share uh, coherent system memory. Uh, so, so this might be slightly confusing to you if, if you thought of the, uh, the local store, which was private to the synergistic processor element as the defining aspect of the, uh, the cell architecture. But, but I, I, I think it was actually uh, this notion of having uh, processing elements of different types uh, share the same uh, coherent infrastructure. So the SPEs, even though it was done indirectly through the local store, uh, which you can, for this purpose, almost think of as a second level uh, register file, um, you know, would, would access uh, shared coherent memory with the, the same effective ad uh, virtual addresses that the, uh, that the power processor would. And in fact, it was possible to say pass a pointer between the power processor and a synergistic processing element. And, and in fact, and this is also something that maybe not too many people realized, um, you, you know, the synergistic processing elements um, also had a, a tiny uh, L2, uh, which allowed them to do uh, participate in uh, uh, you know, synchronization uh, type operations. So they had a load line and reserve and a uh, store line conditional, uh, which matched up with the uh, power architecture um, uh, you know, load word and reserve and load word condition, a uh, store, sorry, load word and reserve and store word conditional. Uh, and, and therefore, um, synergistic processing elements could do things like take uh, data from a, uh, or tasks from a, uh, a shared, shared queue. And, and that was actually quite uh, essential to the efficiency uh, of the overall system. Uh, you also see a little box on the right uh, labeled I.O. translation, uh, which, you know, normally is handled uh, separately because uh, I.O. adapters tend to have a more limited view uh, of, uh, of system uh, memory. Um, now, you might associate the cell processor with things like games or, or maybe uh, physics applications, uh, but in, in fact, the processor was, was quite effective on uh, big data and analytics workloads as well. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details of this, but for things like searching, MapReduce, sorting, uh, or list rank, uh, if you go through the details here, you'll see that, the, uh, that this type of organization uh, was about uh, an order of magnitude for uh, more efficient for a similar amount of silicon resource. Um, and you know, just to give you a quick explanation, um, you know, if you look at the, uh, the chip there, you can see that we had, um, um, you know, about four processing, uh, synergistic processing elements in a similar amount of resource as a conventional uh, core. And then each of these synergistic processing elements, uh, because they were able to, uh, because they were fetching their data asynchronously and under program control, uh, was able to gain another factor of two or so in efficiency. And that's roughly where that order of magnitude came from. So um, after uh, working on the cell processor, uh, we uh, wanted to extend this notion, not just to a chip, uh, but to a, to a system. And uh, we prototyped something on, uh, on Power7 um, that, that had shared memory, but was not coherent. And then introduced the uh, CAPI interface on, uh, on Power8 uh, that uh, allowed us to, uh, to have a, uh, a, you know, again, a coherent uh, shared view of, uh, of memory. And, uh, you know, here you kind of see how that was done for, uh, for, for an FPGA uh, within the uh, Power8 processor. Uh, there was a uh, unit, uh, the coherent accelerator, processor proxy uh, 
be in, in introduced uh, that would pass on the, the data uh, to the uh, to the FPGA in this case, and it also took, took care of, uh, of of snoops on on behalf of the accelerator, so it had some uh, directory of uh, what data was held in the accelerator, and then on the accelerator uh, there was the power service layer, uh, which performed address translation. Uh, and uh, the things like uh, like caching, and this allowed us to do things on the FPGA that was, uh, you know, and, and the same would have been possible for for ASICs as well. Uh, that was the equivalent of the uh, shared memory uh, access that the uh, that the SPEs in the cell processor uh, enjoyed. Uh, I mentioned uh, I/O translation earlier, and. Uh, you know, normally things like storage adapters or network adapters, uh, you know, would, would have a, uh, a much more limited uh, view of memory. Uh, but what we did uh, using this CAPI interface and by uh, adding some flash memory uh, to an FPGA, like I showed uh, before, uh, we, we were able to, to get um, the benefits of, uh, of sharing this effective address, virtual address space uh, with an I/O adapter as well, and in a particular case of a of a you know low latency storage adapter, uh, you see here that uh, by actually having this uh, uh, shared coherent view of memory, uh, we were able to dramatically uh, reduce the number of instructions uh, that would be needed to get at some uh, data that might be held in flash on this uh, particular type. Uh, of of, uh, of storage adapter. Um, so, you, you know what that resulted in is uh, there was a was a product that IBM uh, had uh, called the IBM Data Engine for NoSQL, which used an uh, IBM Flash system, which uh, uses NAND Flash but is relatively low latency. Um, and and here you see a comparison between. Uh, attaching that flash system through a conventional PCI uh, I/O space adapter uh, or one of these uh, coherent shared memory adapters, and what you see is a, uh, a dramatic improvement in the number of, of IOPS per thread. Um, you know, in line with the uh, reduction in the number of instructions required per access that I showed on the previous slide. Uh, and also a uh, significant reduction in uh, in latency, uh, again primarily from uh, avoiding a number of the um, uh, a, a lot of the code paths that uh, that I that I showed uh, earlier. And uh, we actually worked with some uh, uh, ISVs, uh, so Redis Labs and Neo4j in particular, uh, were able to uh, to leverage this uh, this capability. And um, access the, uh, the, the the flash or storage in a in a way that is much more in line uh, with what you uh, what you would think of as as uh, as memory access, uh, and 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 therefore you know allowing very large uh, key value or uh, uh, graph store uh, much much larger than you would have been able to do with uh, with conventional DRAM. And, and at, uh, at, at reasonable performance. Uh, I would be amiss if I didn't also mention uh, a similar effort uh, by, uh, by, by Xilinx, again, leveraging the same uh, CAPI uh, interface. And uh, they also demonstrated a, a key value store. They, they took uh, you know, a little bit more of the perspective of, uh, from the accelerator side than, than the host side. Uh, but this is a, a very, very similar uh, effort. So, you know, that, that brings me to, uh, you know, sort of the uh, uh, mid 2010s and uh, the, uh, you know, the start of the AI era. And as we know, and it's illustrated in this slide with, uh, you know, two uh, systems from, from about that time, uh, Bandwidth is incredibly uh, important when, when you're doing uh, AI and, and, and deep deep learning uh, in particular. Uh, so in the case of the HTX2, you know, at the back of the system, there is a, a very hefty interconnect between those two uh, 
processor boards, and uh, and here you see a picture of the uh, the, the Google uh, uh, GPU, uh, and and there you know the, the 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 cables and and actually also water pipes for cooling are uh, are quite visible. Um, so what we we do uh, with the uh, the power systems, uh, we uh, took the same uh, technology that Nvidia. Uh, the same type of technology that NVIDIA had been using to uh, interconnect their um, uh, graphics processors and, and share memory between the graphics processors and uh, came to a consistent definition of the, uh, the physical layer and the protocol uh, so that we could include that in, the, uh, in a, a version of the Power 8 processor uh, and, uh, and build a system that had the uh, NVIDIA processors uh, attached at high bandwidth. Um, so you see a, a diagram here, and that uh, 80 gigabytes per second uh, to, uh, to the NVIDIA processors is uh, you know, considerably uh, higher than the Gen 3 PCI Express. Uh, that, that would have been around uh, 16 gigabytes per second. Uh, that was typical uh, at the time. Um, you know, this was taken to a next level with uh, with Power Nine and uh, uh, the systems that uh, that ultimately ended up in the uh, in the core old uh, supercomputers. Um, and uh, you see that the, the the bandwidth here is you know uh, with the next generation and VLink and also going from two to three interfaces uh, per GPU uh, was uh, uh, became uh, 150 gigabytes per second. And, and actually, you see that the uh, that the NVLink bandwidth very nearly matches uh, the main memory bandwidth. So, also from a bandwidth perspective, now the GPUs have uh, unfettered access uh, to uh, to large system memory. Uh, and this this has a, a, a number of uh, benefits. Uh, and in particular, here, you know, it would allow us to start uh, store very very large models for uh, for AI and deep learning. In system memory, and uh, do things uh, like uh, operate at uh, at one layer at a time, you know, which is a somewhat different uh, way of um, uh, processing, uh, and, you know, your, your your deep learning problem uh, with um, you know benefits for 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 uh, conver convergence time and, uh, and and simplicity of programming. Uh, so this uh, system. It actually came in two flavors, uh, an air, you see it in the bottom left, an air-cooled one and a water-cooled one. Um, and, um, you know, this ended up in the, uh, in the Coral supercomputers. Um, and I think you're uh, quite familiar with this. Um, so that system was the number one uh, in, in 2018, and it's, uh, you know, still very highly ranking. And uh, it was actually, uh, uh, if you look at it through an AI lens, uh, you might be interested in the, uh, uh, the three greater than three exaflop uh, half precision. And by the more conventional double precision oriented metric, uh, it was a 200 petaflop uh, system. Um, so it, it certainly was uh, helpful for, uh, for deep learning. And I, you know, you, one could spend uh, an entire talk looking at all the different ways that um, this system was used, uh, this class of systems was used for AI applications, uh, but I just highlighted two. Uh, the first one, the uh, Gordon Bell Prize in, in 2018, uh, which uh, uh, you know, had a, a, a deep learning application for uh, climate science that was actually able to achieve uh, more than an uh, exa op. Uh, you know, not the double precision uh, operations, but but lighter weight ones uh, on on that machine. Uh, and there's also, uh, you know, the system uh, was was leading on a um, an, uh, an AI uh, HPL AI benchmark. Um, but it, you know, for this talk, I'm I'm really a little bit more uh, interested in the, the uh, in the architectural aspects. Um, so with Power9, we also made a transition uh, illustrated on this slide from the um, uh, CAPI interface to the open CAPI interface, uh, which is largely uh, a transition uh, in terms of the, uh, the physical organization of the system. 
Um, so because we didn't really want to in change form factors and uh, because it was a late introduction on power eight, um, you know, we layered the uh, uh, coherent protocol on top of uh, PCIe data packets and, and actually a, 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 a CAPI accelerator card looked physically like a, um, a PCI Express uh, adapter card. Uh, you know, that, that had some uh, overhead, both in terms of uh, protocol overhead and because we were running inside these data packets and also added latency. And on Power9, what we did is we uh, uh, actually, um, you know, changed the interface to something that was had shared files with our SNP fabric and also the NVLink protocol. Um, uh, but and, and also what we did is we moved the address translation layer uh, on, onto the chip. So to these uh, two things uh, led to uh, significantly reduced uh, latency and, uh, and higher bandwidth efficiency. And, uh, you know, on this slide, you can see some of the, uh, the, the, the FPGAs. Uh, that that we uh, that we would use with the open copy interface. So they still look like PCI Express cards, uh, but uh, you know, except for some initialization and power, uh, the data actually comes through these uh, these open copy connectors that you can see uh, near the right hand side or or the the, the top uh, of these cards. And um, they were running. Uh, they were. Uh, these are eight bit wide, uh, eight lane wide um, uh, interfaces running at 25 uh, gigabit per second per lane uh, with an effective data rate of um, uh, uh, 20, up to 22 to 23 gigabytes per second. So a very, very high um, uh, efficiency. So let me give a brief recap of, um, of what I've gone over so far. So, you know, we've talked about uh, being able to share memory amongst uh, heterogeneous processing elements within the chip. Uh, we've talked a little bit about sharing uh, amongst processing elements uh, at the system level. Um, and we talked about the benefits of having, uh, uh, giving a, a storage adapter, and, and I, I could go through a similar story for network adapters, uh, giving them uh, access to uh, to virtual addresses and uh, in the system. Um, so, so now uh, I want to get to uh, to, to power ten, and um, actually uh, this notion of um, uh, memory disaggregation or, or cluster level uh, shared memory, and um, we'll we'll talk about two things. One is the uh, prototype on power nine called Cymesis Flow and uh, a technology in the Power 10 processors called uh, Memory Inception. So, so first, um, you know, I, I, I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that, uh, uh, you know, there are actually two, two aspects that uh, uh, are significant contributors to the cost of large systems. Uh, you know, one of them is the cost of memory, and the other one is uh, the cost of uh, networking infrastructure. And if we look at a Power 10 uh, chip, uh, it actually has 16 um, memory interfaces. Uh, in Power 10, we do this uh, based on uh, the open copy memory interface, uh, which is an, uh, a, you know, a, a standardized um, memory interface with uh, lanes that can go up to 32 gigatransactions per second. Uh, as, and, and there are 16 of these interfaces uh, at, uh, you know, one byte in each direction. So that gives you 32 plus 32 gigabytes per second times 16, which is a terabyte per second. And, and similarly, uh, the uh, SMP interfaces, which uh, is um, consistent uh, with the, uh, the, the open copy uh, interface, uh, uh, can be configured that way. Um, also 16 interfaces and, and similarly adding up uh, to uh, a terabyte per second. So 
um, you know, you can think of this as, um, you know, a 32 port switch, you know, where, where each port is uh, 32 uh, uh, gigabyte per second or, 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 or more than, than uh, 200 uh, uh, gigabit per second. So it's, you know, even, even though this is a, <laughs> certainly a powerful processor, it's actually, uh, you know, a fairly powerful switch uh, as well. So, so we'll we'll try to to uh, to leverage that aspect of it. Um, you know, I, I mentioned uh, memory technologies. So, so one of the reasons uh, GPUs tend to do well is um, that they provide very uh, high bandwidth. That's uh, uh, you know, with these memory stacks, HBM interfaces. Uh, but the the memory is of somewhat uh, uh, limited capacity. You know, the alternative, of course, uh, for higher capacity memory is a standard DDR4 interface. Um, so that gives you uh, high capacity, but uh, much lower bandwidth per unit of die edge. And, um, you, you know, chip, of, of course, uh, multi-core processors, the number of cores that uh, you can have on a processor grows with the, uh, with the area of the processor, uh, but the chip edge, uh, you know, only grows uh, you know, it's, it's actually a, uh, you know, and, and unless you grow the physical size of the chip, is, uh, is, is, is more or less a constant from one generation to the technology and also the analog circuitry that you have doesn't tend to scale as well. So how efficient you are in terms of, of bandwidth and supporting capacity, you know, with a certain amount of chip edge is actually fairly crucial. So, so we have a, a gener um, an, an open standard uh, buffered interface um, that uh, again is signaling wise consistent uh, with these uh, these SMP and and, and other uh, open copy interfaces that that kind of gives us the best of both, both worlds in terms of you know bandwidth per per die edge it's it's uh, competitive with something like HBM2 and in terms of uh, capacity uh, we can actually exceed what you can provide with a standard DDR uh, interface. Um, you know, mo most server processors, you will see uh, eight uh, memory uh, channels, and, and this provides uh, 16. Um, we also have uh, significantly enhanced the compute within the chip, um, you know, with both SIMD capability and uh, a matrix math acceleration that also supports the uh, AI uh, kind of uh, oriented uh, lower lower precision uh, floating point and integer uh, data types, you know, used in uh, deep learning uh, and inferencing models. Um, so, and, and we pay a lot of attention to to bring the bandwidth capability that we have at the at the chip level, you know, all the way down to these uh, to these execution units. Um, so if you compare power 10 to uh, power 9, and this is a comparison uh, for a, uh, you know, we haven't announced any systems, but, but uh, you, you know, for a notional two socket server, uh, you know, you would see uh, order of magnitude type improvements uh, for, uh, uh, in, you know, LINPAC as well as AI uh, inferencing type applications between power 9 and uh, power 10. Um, so, you know, going back to the to the main theme of this talk, so um, we have these uh, uh, these interfaces. Uh, we are able to create uh, an SMP, a standard SMP shared memory system, uh, which for for power we we typically build these um, uh, up to to sixteen uh, socket SMPs, and that's certainly also possible with Power Ten. We have the open copy interface that allows you to have acceleration or, uh, you know, memory or storage attached in memory like ways. Um, and on the DRAM side, you know, we have uh, a, a standardized interface that we can use to support 16 um, more conventional DRAM channels, but also um, because it's a buffered interface, we can put other kinds of memory technologies like storage class memory. Uh, or GDR, GDDR, or, or or other types of memory uh, behind that. 
in the top left here, uh, you'll see uh, integrated memory clustering, and that's uh, what we will talk about next. And I'll talk first about uh, the prototype of this that we uh, worked on with uh, IBM research um, called the Thymesis flow. So um, what you do here is um, you actually use the OpenCAPI interface in two different modes. So let's say that um, you know, this uh, processor on the left, the Power9 processor on the left, wants to access memory on another processor in the cluster. So you use a virtual address or actually effective address, translated to a real address, and that real address gets mapped to a, uh, a particular open copy port. Uh, in the Power9 prototype, we use an FPGA to pick up uh, that memory uh, access request. Uh, it gets transferred um, between the two, two FPGAs. We use uh, 100 gigabit, um, uh, you know, uh, 100 gigabit Ethernet-like cable. Uh, it's a, a, a Xilinx specific surdies. And there is an option to also do switching there in the middle. We haven't done that in the prototype. But then on the other side, and this is really where the uh, you know, special aspect of uh, of this comes in. Uh, we come in with an effective address, uh, and then the Power9 processor um, on the on the right. You know now the, it comes into the Power9 processor uh, with with an effective address, and that processor again maps that address to uh, a real address. So, you know, if you are in a uh, perhaps a cloud type of context. And I know um, I have a situation where I might have a total amount of uh, memory requested uh, amongst, uh, in this example, eight systems, where the top, total amount of the memory requested maybe adds up to something like 64 terabyte, uh, which could have been uh, you know, is equivalent to, to, to eight terabyte per system. But some of the systems actually uh, request much more memory than that uh, uh, than that uh, eight terabytes. So what we could have done is build uh, a, a big SMP and and uh, partition it. Uh, but what we can also do is use this uh, um, you, know, you know memory uh, Synesis flow or memory inception technology uh, to um, to achieve this. Um, so. Uh, by leveraging uh, 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 this technology where we go out. Um, so, so, so ba basically what you do is in the uh, target system that you want to borrow memory from, um, you, you do a, a, a malloc uh, and you get an uh, effective address range that is associated with the memory that you've allocated in that particular system. And the uh, timesis flow or memory inception uh, connection uh, takes care of uh, uh, mapping the uh, physical address range in your, uh, the, the real address range in your processor uh, to that effective address range with which it comes out uh, at the other end. And doing so, I can, um, you know, give a, a processor the illusion um, that it's uh, that it's able to to uh, di directly access the uh, the memory across this entire cluster. Um, so we can can use that in a in a number of different ways. You can, um, uh, you know, the example here is is maybe more of a cloud type example. Uh, you can also uh, look at perhaps one of a, a scale up type SMPs as a uh, as a memory server and uh, attach a lot of uh, compute servers to it uh, through through this kind of technology. And and you can even uh, repeat this trick. Right, so um, if I come in with an, uh, uh, so, so if I'm making a, a, a request on, uh, on one processor, uh, it gets mapped to a, uh, an, an open copy link, comes in on the other side with an effective address, you know, corresponding to a, a, a memory address range that, that, uh, that I've, I've, uh, I've agreed upon. Uh, the receiving processor can 
of course, take that address and map it to memory that is resident in that processor, but it can also map it to another uh, open copy link and, and, and the process can repeat itself. So we can have uh, address range windows uh, that um, uh, you know, correspond to each of the systems. And uh, uh, you know, Bill Starkey, who, who, who uh, went over this uh, during the introduction of the Power 10 processor at Hot Chips, uh, he calls this uh, routing uh, through the page table. So we can uh, you know, create a, uh, uh, a shared memory cluster uh, you know, with, 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 without actually uh, communication adapters, right? In, in Power 10, the, uh, the FPGAs are no longer necessary and, and the, the function is, uh, uh, can be supported with, uh, with, with simply uh, an open copy cable from, from one system to the next. So, um, well, th this, is, uh, this is great. It actually gives us um, um, you know, an in enormous capability. We have uh, address enough bits in our uh, address translation tables, et cetera, to support up to two petabytes of addressability in, uh, in Power 10. So you could create a cluster like this with uh, two petabytes of uh, addressable memory. Uh, and uh, it doesn't, you know, as, as pointed out before, it doesn't all have to be DRAM. It, it can be uh, a mix of, of DRAM and uh, uh, a cheaper per, per bit uh, type technology. So, so if you have a, 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 a you know, a cluster that, that, that might be uh, up to two petabytes, um, you know, you, you, you could uh, essentially keep all of your data there. Um, but besides the uh, physical organization of the system, uh, there is also the, uh, you know, the, the, the programming uh, and, and uh, uh, software view that we have to worry about. So uh, uh, particularly in uh, big data frameworks, you know, like uh, Java, or Python, or so on, um, you know, in memory data is, is, is considered uh, uh, private to the application and, 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 and often not even under direct control of the application. And what I mean by this is that, uh, you, you know, the, the, the JVM is free to reorganize the data, um, you know, uh, during runtime, which makes it uh, basically impossible to, to uh, pass, you know, these uh, uh, virtual address pointers to, to, to other things and, and directly and efficiently access that data. Um, so if we want to um, think of, of this two petabyte of memory in a similar way that you might think about a, a file system uh, in, a, in a conventional cluster, uh, we are going to need to have uh, standardized ways of, uh, of, of getting at the data, um, which means not only a shared uh, effective address uh, across the system, which Hopefully, I've explained how, how, how that can be achieved. Um, but, but also, uh, we have to think about the data in memory, um, much like we think about uh, file formats and, and as, as something that, that should be intrinsically uh, shareable. Um, so, you know, one, one example and, and one that we've worked on uh, with a, a, a group at, uh, at TU Delft uh, is uh, uh, based on Apache Arrow. So Apache Arrow defines the uh, in-memory layout of uh, column-oriented uh, tabular data structures. Um, it's used by uh, NVIDIA uh, with a, a set of application libraries uh, called RAPIDS uh, to efficiently use uh, uh, GPU acceleration in a, in a manner that's also consistent with these uh, uh, Spark um, or, or, or other JVM-based uh, uh, runtimes, Python, etc. Uh, so we've uh, created something similar for FPGAs, and in, in doing some in, in doing this, we uh, uh, avoid the serialization, deserialization overheads uh, that are normally associated with uh, accessing, uh, you know. Or data in, in these kinds of uh, environments and getting getting to an accelerator. Uh, uh, so there are two frameworks that, uh, that that we developed in the group in Delft. The first one is called uh, Fletcher, 
um, and um, it uh, what it does is based on an uh, arrow schema will generate all of the uh, FPGA infrastructure uh, needed to uh, to read these um, uh, column number tables and uh, provide the data to uh, an accelerated uh, implementation. It also provides a sort of a harness, a, a, a template inside which you can uh, develop that accelerator. So this gets uh, allows you to to focus on the uh, on, on the on the kernel uh, and, uh, and and generate uh, the rest of the FPGA interface that uh, that will bring the uh, Apache Arrow data to you in a in a streaming fashion. There's also a complementary effort that was uh, reported last year in a IEEE micro paper um, called Tidy, uh, where we try to take a systematic look. At, uh, at the specification of hardware streams and come to uh, composable designs, which um, you know should help us in the creation of uh, you know what what goes into these uh, accelerator uh, kernels, but also uh, you know further further generalize uh, the interface. Uh, but both both are open source uh, projects, uh, and uh, I gave the links here. So if I uh, net this out, um, uh, you know, we, we can, uh, I think, drive significant uh, improvements in efficiency and, uh, and ease of use by providing uh, a virtual address-based view of, uh, of memory at the cluster level. In doing so, I think we can also drive significant efficiencies into uh, the networking technology. Uh, the, uh, you know, can get to a, a two petabyte uh, shared address space uh, with power 10. And um, uh, also, as I pointed out, uh, the fact that you no longer have to use DRAM uh, for all of this, um, um, you know, make, makes this uh, uh, extra feasible. Um, and with the uh, um, streaming type technologies, as we had in the in the case of Cell, with the um, asynchronous prefetching of data, or in the case of Fletcher, uh, with the uh, streaming interface for for FPGAs. Um, but there are also other efforts for um, you know conventional processors, where you know we try to decouple the um, you know the data fetching from the uh, from the execution uh, better than we do today. Uh, you know, ho hopefully we can create uh, systems that, that, uh, that, that really uh, get us to a new level of, uh, of capability. Uh, we will need to complement that with a uh, few of data structures in memory that is uh, shareable, the way uh, files are shareable. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Apache Arrow is an interesting example of, uh, of something like this. The fact that Apache Arrow data structures are immutable, um, might also help uh, with, uh, with coherence limitations, right? Because a memory inception type cluster is coherent within each node, uh, but, it's, uh, it's, but it's only locally coherent, right? Uh, remote nodes don't get updated, uh, you know, whenever uh, a local change is made. Uh, but there's a lot more uh, to learn. So I've listed some of the, the research questions here. Um, so the first one is, you know, now, now that, that uh, um, we, can, we can organize uh, an, an, an the same hardware as either an SMP or a cluster, uh, I think we can have, um, you know, more systematic looks at uh, the difference between, uh, between SMPs and clusters. And, and when, when do you benefit from being locally coherent versus coherent? And which also there's aspects of resiliency and security and reliability there. Um, this notion of operating systems that uh, so so we you know in organizing uh, the addressability in in a, a thymesis flow or memory inception cluster, uh, we are you know coordinating between the operating systems in a somewhat ad hoc manner at the moment. But one could think about more systematic ways of doing this. Um, we talked about the uh, standardized in memory data structures that should go along with this. And I, I should mention that the, the notion of having, you know, just a single level uh, uh, store, right, for, for uh, 
you, the data that you would normally think of as in, in the file system as, and in memory data is of course not really a new concept. Uh, it's uh, well known in, in IBM I or the old system 38 uh, and goes back to even Multics, I believe. Um, and, and we need, uh, you know, improved uh, hardware software interfaces. So, uh, you know, I talked about a, a couple of uh, research efforts at TU Delft uh, doing so for, uh, for streaming data and FPGAs. Um, but there's certainly a lot of work to be done in uh, microprocessors to, to essentially get us from, you know, latency tolerance that is now in out of order processors, maybe at best in the order of a microsecond or so to the handful of microseconds that you need in order to use much less expensive um, uh, memory technologies like, uh, like low latency flash or, or phase change memory. Um, and the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Power9 uh, prototype is available now uh, and, uh, and, and the vast majority of, of what I talked about here and certainly everything you need to do this research is uh, available as open source projects. Um, so here are some, some of the, the references. And with that, um, and again with the apologies for the late start, uh, I'll, I'll take some quick questions. Okay, excellent. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice talk. Quite deep down technical and interesting. So I'm from Europe and we have an interesting perspective, especially when we see Summit as a very, let's say, uh, homogeneous system. So we in Europe are more into modular supercomputing architectures, largely because we also don't have the funding, right, to create simply a system like Summit. I would be interested in your views of when you think about a more modular constellation of systems and shared memory, when you think about you have one cluster module with very high single thread performance, you would have a booster module, which has more GPU scalable workloads. And maybe you mentioned also Spark and you know the data right. analytics modules, which needs very high memory, I think, like Spark, otherwise you lose all the benefits. What's your What's your approach or have you discussed this at EBM or in your research to think about this more modular approaches? Yeah, yeah, I, I think my, my answer here probably uh, in light of the talk is not going to be uh, so surprising. Um, so, so you, you know, my, my view is certainly that um, the, the, the fact that we may want to have very different type of, uh, of processing elements, different types of memory, um, and, 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 and even interconnect technologies, um, you know, shouldn't distract us from uh, wanting to pro provide a, uh, a consistent view of memory across the cluster. Um, so, you know, I'm a strong proponent of, um, you know, having um, memory addressability and memory data structures that can be shared and, and look the same, you know, whether I access it with a, uh, uh, a conventional uh, microprocessor, uh, uh, an, an, an FPGA that is being reprogrammed, or, or even, you know, an ASIC that does a, a particular kind of function. Um, I, I do think that we still need to make improvements. I, I think the, um, for example, I, I, I'm also a very strong proponent of, uh, you know, task-oriented kinds of approaches, uh, because I believe that the level of granularity uh, at which we need to think about what we do to this, um, you know, uh, shared memory at, at the top level uh, needs to go up and, and tasks are, are generally higher granular uh, things. Um, and, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the one place where um, I, I, I do feel that, that, that some compromise is needed is that um, you know? I, I I do realize that a a shared coherent memory across a very large cluster uh, is a is a very expensive thing. Uh, you know, in in, in that uh, snoops can make up a lot of your your bandwidth and and, and bring your system performance down. So um, you know, even even though it's it's of course possible to provide a software coherent view uh, across a system. Uh, that is only uh, locally hardware coherent. And, and in fact, the first Power8 uh, prototype that we did, oh, no, sorry, Power8 system that we did with NVIDIA 
you know, was 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 uh, was really more software coherent than hardware coherent. Um, you know, that that is an area where, where I, I think at the hardware level you do you do need to make some compromises. But I, I don't think there are very good reasons for. Um, you know, uh, diff different kinds of, 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 of views of the memory uh, as a, what I would say, an unnecessary con consequence of wanting to use different kinds of modular elements. So I, I hope that provides an answer to your question. Just wanted to say thanks. I think I was muted again, but thanks. I think it gave you a good perspective. Thanks. That's all. Um, thank you, Peter, for joining us today and for providing a very informative talk. All right. Thank you so much for having me.